Okay, I think we're going to get started. I'm going to ask my friend Scott Miller to come up and make some opening remarks. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. We're going to have a conversation today about the future of U.S. trade facilitation and its development impact, and we do so within the context of the recent uh, WTO agreement that was uh, agreed upon, I guess is how I would describe it, as opposed to it was not signed, and I think we'll learn a lot more about that. Uh, but I think it's this a very interesting area of trade and development, and we've been working a lot on these issues at the, the intersection for the last several years at CSIS. But I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Scott Miller. Scott? Thank you, Dan, and welcome to CSIS. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to just very briefly uh, congratulate the United States and all the members of the uh, World Trade Organization at concluding the Bali Agreement, which includes an agreement to uh, uh, implement, a, implement uh, a, uh, a treaty on trade facilitation. What I'd like to do today in a very uh, brief period of time is talk about the three reasons that the trade facilitation agreement is good for development. First, trade facilitation is good for economic growth and trade growth. Trade facilitation is the set of disciplines and guidelines that, that can lower border transaction costs and allow goods to move efficiently and predictably. It's, a, it's important to recognize that trade costs are trade costs, whether they're tariffs or uh, non-tariff barriers or just the frictions that occur at borders. And all of them matter to the efficient movement of goods. Trade facilitation is particularly important in the 21st century uh, trading system, which is basically firm-directed global value chains. For countries to effectively participate in global value chains, they need to be good importers, uh, because 60% of trade in goods is intermediate products. But they also need to be able to move products in and out of their markets efficiently, quickly, and predictably. Trade facilitation helps that. How big a, a deal is this for world trade? Well, Gary Huffbauer and Jeff Schott of the Peterson Institute for International Economics estimates that the trade facilitation agreement is worth about a trillion dollars in annual trade growth. So it's a big number. About half that it goes to developing countries, about half to developed. So it's, it's a big win economically. Tra it will grow trade, and trade growth will help income growth. The second reason that the Bali Agreement is a big deal is that it's a very high leverage investment for development. The uh, development experts and, and, and uh, funders have lots of decisions to make about where they invest. What a 2009 study showed is that every dollar spent on trade facilitation, that would be customs, procedures or efficiency in ports or whatever it might be, but every dollar spent generates $6.37 in annual trade growth uh, for the economy that invests it. So those were in aid for trade countries. So the countries most in need of this, most benefiting from it, can ha undertake a very high leverage investment by, by spending on better ports, better customs facilities. Finally, Trade facilitation agreement at Bali is, a good, is good for development because it's a sign that the multilateral system can work as intended. This is the first truly multilateral agreement that the trading system has produced since GATT 94, so 20 years for the first agreement. But it's an important one because many of us have long hoped for more from the WTO, but whatever it produces, it produces the greatest good for the most people in supporting a multilateral rules-based trading system. The fact that the Bali Agreement was achieved is good news for the future of development and the future of the multilateral trading system. With that said, let me uh, extend my welcome to you here today at CSIS and turn the program over to Eric Post Post Postel. Eric is Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Economic Growth, Education, and Environment at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Eric. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I am here to um, maybe give a little uh, historical context, although Don is much more expert and, and will probably amplify, and then also talk a little bit about USAID's involvement in this area because when as we start to um, as, as this thing starts to move forward and one starts looking at implementation um, we, we are one of the 
um, instruments of the U.S. government to, to work on this with the members of the private sector in our country as well as all these uh, developing country participants and to have conversations with other uh, donors in, in other countries. Um, so, as you know, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, known as uh, the TFA, um, was the signature accomplishment of the Bali package um, adopted in December at uh, the ministerial conference, the ninth ministerial conference of, of the WTO. And as, as you just heard, it's, it's this f first multilateral agreement reached by WTO um, since its creation under as part of the Uruguay round of negotiations and also represents the first agreement under the so-called Doha Development Agenda or Doha round of trade negotiations started a while ago. Um, and one of the ra object uh, objectives of that round was to improve the trading prospects of developing countries and this uh, agreement is targeted at that. And we know that um, improving the trading prospects of the developing countries is also good business for our own country. Um, the negotiations, I believe, Don, started in 2004 on this. And um, at times, people thought, oh, this is going to be easy. We're going to get this done quickly. Um, it compared to other things being talked about in Geneva, and it didn't exactly uh, work out that way and because it even though it seemed like, oh, timely movement of goods across borders ought to be a win-win for everybody. So uh, to our way of thinking, um, there's several reasons for this. Um, and, but in some cases, the opposition was less on the substance of the agreement and more on other concerns that, that I'll try to characterize. One, there were a number of developing countries which took the position tacitly that anything desired by the developed countries uh, must not be good for them, so there must be some trick to this. Um, luckily, that number of countries was modest and I think shrunk over time as they saw um, themselves growing um, in, often through trade. Um, more problematic uh, among some of those was that um, some of those countries felt that these discussions were an opportunity to exact a price from developed countries, particularly in the area of agricultural market access issues. And so they were reluctant to make any trade facilitation commitments, even in the face of all these studies that their own folks had done that indicated that um, this would pay significant dividends uh, for their countries, for their businesses, and for their people. So uh, these, these things uh, were some of the things that um, were got in the way. And I'm sure Dawn may elaborate, and she's going to give more details of exactly what got done. Um, the other, another reason for the resistance, um, and was maybe a little more understandable, is that many developing countries viewed with concern any new WTO commitments as being binding obligations on members. And they may not have fully understood that in the aftermath of the Uruguay round. And uh, they realized that when they signed this stuff, it actually had a lot of implications for them. That um, you know, their focus on becoming members of the WTO, for instance, um, Trown, they w had them so consumed with that that they weren't necessarily paying attention to all of the uh, things they had to do to comply with WTO agreements. And so they were very, f um, they, they really need to focus on how do we deal with the challenges of implementing things like that. And they wanted to be very careful about um, what they were, what they were going to do, what developed countries were going to do, and so forth, if they were going to sign on for new things. So I think some of that helps understand why the TFA, which aims to streamline trade, also has this, se it has this section called Section 2, Special and Differential Treatment Provisions for Developing Country Members and Least Developed Country Members. That's a mouthful. But in essence, it constitutes an agreement by the donor countries to provide technical assistance and capacity building related to the implementations of the provisions of the TFA. And, um, and, um, and that was a very important thing because the agreement was very clear that um, there, should, there would be some flexibilities about implementation time frames and that, they, and that if they didn't have um, capacity that, that, that that's something that had to be worked in through all this. 
So in order to achieve all the benefits, the bottom line is to achieve all the benefits, donor countries and recipient countries have to work closely together. Um, now, the, the potential benefits of the agreement um, are huge, as, as you heard. And there have been other studies about this that in a whole range of areas, whether um, total trade costs, reduction, uh, uh, both for low-income countries, for middle-income countries, across, all of them would have a number of benefits under this. Uh, OECD study showed this and, and many others. So what is USAID's role in this as, as we go forward? I mean, we've, we've always been involved in trade facilitation activities around the world. We're the largest provider within the U.S. government of trade capacity building assistance. We know it's an important issue, and um, we have a number of bilateral or regional programs that focus on things like customs reform or other aspects of trade facilitation. And um, for example, we've got three trade hubs in Africa, as a number of you know, and they all have focused on trade facilitation measures working bilaterally and with the regional economic communities to reduce the time and cost of moving trade within Africa and between Africa and the United States. We've also worked on trade facilitation in the Asia-Pacific region, working with ASEAN, and we've done plenty of stuff in Latin America and so forth. So we, we know there's a strong linkage between trade and economic growth, and we know that there's a number of impediments, and in some of those cases, donor involvement can help improve things. In other cases, it's things the governments have to do on their own. Um, so during these talks, we've tried to support um, the USTR team working on those, all this, and we've also um, facilitated WTO self-assessments for 20 countries, and we launched in 2011 something we call Partnership for Trade Facilitation, uh, and contributed to the IFC's multi-donor TFA support program. So we've been contributing to some of the prep work that went into this stuff and, and some pr work that helps some of the countries um, g get rolling on this. The, um, that, that partnership for trade facilitation partnership that I mentioned is uh, active in 15 countries addressing issues that um, are directly related to TFA. As far as bilateral programs, every one of our offices overseas then determines how high on the priority list of the issues faced in a country are trade issues. But uh, a number of them around the world have worked on different things, such as um, custom streamlining, helping to create single windows, one-stop border points, um, IT integration so that customs authorities across m several countries can move documents electronically and in turn move them electronically with businesses. So there's been a host of projects in different countries depending on a complex uh, process of setting priorities both within the U.S. government and with those countries. So, um, as we go forward, though, we're going to have to figure out what, what else we have to do, what are the things that um, those of you in the private sector think are some of the main priorities, what does our, our USTR colleagues think are priorities, and of course talk to local uh, governments. So um, I, I come to make these introductory remarks, but really I've come uh, to listen, and we want to thank um, the private sector for all their support that they've given during the negotiations, and um, we know that we have to be connected with you and listening to you all um, and getting best practices from you all in a partnership to really try to move this forward and facilitate trade. So I look forward to um, hearing from all the experts on the panel and we look forward to hearing all of your inputs both today and in the days ahead because this is a process that's going to spool out over a period of time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for all the work that you guys do at AID. And I know some of the folks here from Virginia and uh, some of the other colleagues are here as well. And I want to thank uh, what the folks at AID do to, to follow up on all the 
on all the agreements that get done, um, and it's good for development, it's good for trade. We have a panel uh, that's going to talk about this, about this, the future of U.S. trade facilitation and its development impact. And um, I'm just going to just recognize each of the panelists very briefly, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to, to Dawn Shackelford. We first have Dawn Shackelford. She's the Deputy Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for the WTO and Multilateral Affairs, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and she was the point person on the negotiations. And so much of the credit goes to USTR, and also congratulations to Dawn for, for making that happen. And so particularly uh, grateful that she's here. We then have uh, Mr. Ralph Carter, who is Managing Director of Trade and International Affairs at FedEx Express. I think he was also at Bali, if I understand it correctly. Were you there? I was only there for the APEC, not for, for the, the APEC. Uh, for the WTO. I let Dawn. I knew she could bring it home. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and he's with uh, he's at Trade and International Affairs at FedEx Express. And then we have my very good friend, Anna Guevara, who's the president of Aventi Associates and the former alternate executive director for the United States for the World Bank. And she's worn other hats uh, at the Department of Commerce, as well as had a distinguished career at, at UPS uh, as well. And so thank you for being here, Anna. And then uh, my friend, Paul Delaney, who's a partner at the Kyle House Group, but many of you know him as a um, as someone who's been a staffer on the Hill working on trade issues, he also had a distinguished career at USTR and also had a, a, a stint in the private sector also at, at FedEx where he was a senior attorney for uh, trade and international affairs. So um, you have their biographies in front of you so you can get a sense of, of who these folks are and in a little bit more detail. But without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Don Shackelford to give us a little bit more context of the agreement as it's been negotiated and, and what the implications are for trade facilitation for the, for the U.S. government more broadly. Don, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you for hosting this event today. And it's really a pleasure to see so much interest in, in the agreement. Um, you know, just to give a little bit of background on the U.S. negotiating position in uh, the WTO negotiation. I'm sorry. Just put it a little closer, Dave. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the U.S. negotiating position, certainly, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the praise, but it, it is a, a group effort. And we do have, uh, within the federal government, there is a trade policy staff committee process in which we have 19 different agencies that do contribute uh, to our development of trade policy negotiating positions. And we work very closely with USAID, of course, but also I see a number of colleagues in the audience who, at even at points, were sitting next to me at the negotiating table um, from Commerce Department and State Department uh, and, and other agencies that were deeply involved in the negotiation. So it is really a, a team effort on the part of the U.S. government to bring home this, this agreement. Um, we also, in addition to having extensive coordination within the U.S. government, we do reach out to stakeholders, whether that be private industry, NGOs, other groups that have an interest in these uh, agreements. And this was true for the entire uh, Bali package. We do have uh, the advantage that the WTO is very um, forward-leaning in its publication of documents. So there is a lot of transparency in this organization. And all of the documents that we were uh, working on, the, the main negotiating text was always public. It was always publicly available on the WTO website. So while we do have set advisory groups that we do rely on, because everyone had access to the text, we certainly received a lot of input from various groups. Uh, and so it was a great opportunity that we would get pretty instant feedback when there would be a, a new revision of the text would be posted after a negotiating session. Um, so we did have a, a lot of input uh, within government, also from a, a broad array of stakeholders that had interests in the agreement to actually get us to uh, where we are. And, and also, of course, the, the, the Hill, too. We, we, our committees of jurisdiction are House Ways and Means, as well as Senate Finance. And we also worked very closely with our committees of jurisdiction on the negotiation of this agreement. Um, there's also a lot of coordination that goes on to to come to this uh, type of agreement in the WTO. As you know, there's, there's 159 current members. Uh, we 
one of the other successes of Bali was that Yemen uh, was agreed as um, concluding their accession process. So we hope to have them as a full member very soon. So getting 160 countries on the same page on what is a very lengthy document with very technical issues was a, a long process. And we certainly had various coordinating groups that we engaged with in Geneva to bring us to the finish line. Uh, the United States created uh, what was called the, the Colorado Group a number of years ago, which um, was made up of kind of the, those who were really what we saw as kind of the friends of trade facilitation, a uh, number of developed countries, but also a number of developing countries that really wanted to push these negotiations forward. That group and members of it worked very closely with what was called the ACP, the African Caribbean Pacific countries, which had a very lead role in the negotiations. And a number of those countries were also very forward leaning on trade facilitation. The African group, the LDC group, and of course, all of the major developing economies like Brazil, India, China, South Africa had very key roles in the negotiations. So it was a kind of a constant coordination effort um, to get everybody moving forward on this agreement over the past several years. And that is part of the reason why it took so long to get everything uh, to where we were able to get it in in Bali. And um, as Eric mentioned earlier, um, I mean, there certainly were uh, some challenges along the way at getting everybody on the same page. And there were certain countries that did want to use this agreement as somewhat of a uh, negotiating chip to get other things that they wanted that were not contained uh, in this agreement. So that was another reason why it took quite a while. But I did want to spend some time, uh, and again, we want to hear from you, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but just talking a little bit about what happens now. So just to, to clarify very clearly what happened in Bali, what we did is we finished the negotiations. So all the members came together and agreed, we are not going to negotiate on this anymore. We are, we are happy with the text as it is. And we're going to set out a few homework assignments between now and we set the date of July of this year to finish a few of these homework assignments, kind of the housekeeping things that need to get done for us to be able to sign the agreement. So the specific tasks that were laid out is we have to set up a committee because the negotiating committee is done. We've done the negotiations. So now what we've established is what's called a preparatory committee. We basically followed what was done during the Uruguay round. After those negotiations were done, the preparatory committees took over to actually start the implementation process. We followed the Uruguay round example. We have now, uh, as of just a few days ago, a chairman. Uh, it's the ambassador of the Philippines who will be chairing the committee. And he will be overseeing uh, some of the steps that we laid out, which are the first thing we're going to try and accomplish is a legal scrub of the text. This is not a negotiation. This is making sure we crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. We also have to uh, finalize a protocol uh, and what this will do is if you look at the WTO agreement itself, there's all of these annexes that go with the WTO agreement. What we have to do is we have to have a protocol that amends the WTO agreement to add the trade facilitation agreement as one of the covered annexes. And this is very important because that means then that the WTO trade facilitation agreement is what is considered then a covered agreement for the purposes of dispute settlement, which means that these are binding obligations under this agreement. So the drafting of, of that text. We actually started a little bit of that in Bali, looking at what we wanted to go in into that. Um, we just didn't have time to fully negotiate that at Bali while we were there. But I think that that process, there, there's a skeleton there, that process will go forward over the next couple months in the preparatory committee. A, another piece of homework is that all of the developing countries have to submit what are called their Category A notifications. And I want to explain what that means in, in layman's terms. In the agreement, as Eric mentioned, there is a there are two sections of the agreement. There's Section 1. These are the um, more technical obligations that there, you will publish your customs procedures, that you will um, allow for pre-arrival processing, you will allow for release under bond, the very technical aspects. The section two of the agreement is how are you going to do all that? How are you going to ensure that you can implement everything that is in section one? And for the developing countries, as, as Eric had, had mentioned, this was a key concern to them. They were worried about how they were going to be able to implement some of these very um, forward-leaning uh, customs practices that 
when you think of the, you know, a country, say, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, a landlocked country in particular that doesn't have many resources, this was a heavy lift for them. And they were very concerned about how they were going to implement this. So a lot of time was spent on this Section 2 and identifying what commitments the countries would undertake at the time of entry into force of the agreement and what commitments they would undertake after a transition period after entry for into force of the agreement. There are the category A provisions are those provisions that countries agree to implement at entry into force of the agreement. There are other commitments that are labeled category B commitments and category C commitments. These are all spelled out in section two. Category B commitments are those that they will implement after a transition period, but they think they can do it on their own without outside help. And category C commitments are those that they think that they will need some form of technical assistance to implement. Those notifications come at a later point in time. But the first thing we're trying to do between now and July is get all of the Category A notifications in, working with countries to help them with that process. And USAID has been very actively involved in that process, as have many other donors. The WTO set out a function of setting up needs assessments uh, to help countries determine what goes into category A, what goes into category B, and what goes into category C, looking at section one of the agreement and putting each of the provisions into one of those three categories. So most of these countries have actually had two of these needs assessments done. So they have something in their hand already that gives some idea of how they can implement the agreement. The category A's come by July. We then uh, are hopefully in a position to sign the agreement in July. We then open the agreement for ratification. Under WTO rules, we need two-thirds of the members to ratify. And at that time, uh, and we have set a, a target date of July 2015 for entry into force. So once we get the two-thirds and the target date being July 2015, we will then have entry into force of the agreement. At that same time, the developing countries will provide their initial draft notifications of category B and C. But we will have a pretty good idea before then what's going to go into B and C because we'll know it's what's not in category A. Um, I think I'm going to stop there <laughs> to just give you a, a kind of an overview of, of what we have coming up in terms of implementation. And while there is this flexibility for the developing countries to choose what goes into these categories, we will be having a lot of consultations with countries on what goes into these categories and encouraging them to put, be as ambitious as possible in this. And the last thing I would note is even though there is this flexibility in the agreement, there is likely going to be more oversight of the implementation of this agreement vice any other preceding WTO agreement because there are so many checks and balances contained in Section 2 that we do believe that we are on a path to achieve full implementation of the agreement in a timely manner. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Ralph. Great. Thank you, Don. Ralph. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Don. <clears throat> Happy to be here today. Uh, I get to give kind of, I guess, a private sector view on this. Let me just echo everybody's statement that this is a, a big deal. Uh, you know, we as the express industry have been promoting customs modernization and trade facilitation for 20 something years. So to us, this is a real validation of a lot of what we've been saying about the economic impact of, of making borders more efficient. So from that standpoint, it's a, it's a huge uh, win for us. Uh, it, it's also, of course, uh, a huge win for the trading com community and, uh, and especially our customers. Uh, you know, what this does is, for the first time, we have binding, enforceable standards that all of these 159, 160, soon to be 160 countries uh, have to comply with, and we've never had that before. Uh, previous to this, we had the World Customs Organization, which put out a very good set of guidelines, but they were voluntary. So what the WTO <clears throat> agreement did was take a lot of those good best practices and put them into this binding agreement. So from that standpoint, it really is a milestone, uh, and we're very, very excited about it. Again, hats off to Don. <clears throat> you know, the U.S. was the, the key demandeur on a lot of the more uh, ambitious uh, provisions of this agreement, uh, and they, they fought tooth and nail all the way down to the, to the last minute. 
to keep the agreement as strong as, as it possibly could be, given that you're negotiating with 159 countries of, of vastly different economic positions. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important, and I think especially important, for development and for developing countries. Uh, in fact, most studies will, will show that the developing countries and least developing countries are going to get the biggest uh, benefit from this. You know, the, the Bali package was supposedly made up of three elements. You had the agriculture, you had trade facilitation, and you had development. In my view, trade facilitation in the long run will be the biggest development boost uh, of all three of those things uh, because of the impact on these countries' ability to compete in global supply chains, to make their economies much more competitive, to enable them to integrate more with the global economy. Uh, you know, I have to say, I have to repeat some of the st statistics uh, that we always hear, you know, 10 percent. Administrative costs account for about 10 percent uh, of the cost of trade, which is twice the average tariff of about 5 percent. That's why studies like the World uh, Economic Forum concluded that if you reduce trade facilitation barriers, uh, you can have six times the impact on GDP than you would if you reduced or eliminated all tariffs around the world. So again, the economic impact of this is, is significant. Uh, but that said, those benefits are only going to be realized if we implement the agreement uh, and if it's implemented uh, to a high standard. So that's where our industry is very, very concerned uh, and interested and will be very engaged as this process rolls out. Don gave you a hint at how complicated the process is in terms of time frames and, and baskets of A, B, and C and, and all of these things. Uh, the other element that makes it complicated is this is not like a lot of international agreements where through the stroke of a pen, you know, you reduce a tariff. That's easy to do and it's easy to verify that it's been done. This agreement is going to require things to actually change. Operational things, practices that have been going on for many years will have to change in order to implement this. And that's difficult. Uh, the, the agreement is not going to implement itself. People will have to do a lot of things to make it happen. And so that's where our industry, again, is very much engaged. Uh, and we see a huge opportunity, of course, to raise the level of performance uh, of, of countries across the world in terms of their border management. But we also see an, an enormous opportunity to drive harmonization of a lot of these standards. Again, the agreement has a lot of technical measures, uh, but in fact they're not that technical in that they say you shall provide expedited clearance or you shall provide pre-arrival. But it doesn't tell you how to do that actually. Uh, and a lot of these countries will be doing these things for the first time. So there's a lot of room for interpretation. And so what we wouldn't want to see is, you know, 160 different versions of expedited clearance, for example. We think you'll get a lot bigger bang for the buck if we have harmonization, if everyone's kind of driving in the same direction. And certainly regionally, we think it makes a lot of sense for trading partners to coordinate with each other and try to use this as an opportunity to drive harmonization and interoperability in their customs regimes with their key trading partners. Again, everybody's going to be doing this, so you have an opportunity, instead of going in 160 different ways, let's all go in the same direction on a lot of these things. Uh, you know, and that's, again, another kind of leveraging of this agreement. The more implementation you have, the more the economic benefits there'll be. It's a multiplier effect. When your neighbors start doing it, you will benefit from it, and on and on. Uh, so the challenge is, okay, how do we, how do we affect this process? How do, how do we as, as industry and, and companies, uh, shippers and retailers and everybody who's concerned about this, how do we organize ourselves to, to engage in the process? And that's what you know, we're looking at right now. Uh, one of the things I think we want to try to come up with is working with groups like the World Customs Organization is a toolkit for implementation, uh, a set of best practices, guidelines, technical standards, that will help a, a country implement the various provisions in the agreement to say, here's actually the best way to do this, here's the most cost-effective way to do it, and here's how you'll get the biggest economic bang for your buck. Uh, and so we're going to be, we're interested in working with uh, USTR, of course, as they 
engage in countries in the implementation process, USAID as the primary U.S. donor uh, to countries. Uh, we also will be working with, uh, hopefully, the World Bank and the regional development banks. Again, to go to them and say, here's what we think is, uh, is a set of best practices, uh, and that they can then take that toolkit and talk to the recipient countries and say, here's what we think is a good, a good way forward for you in terms of implementing these things. There's also going to be a lot of work on which provisions you put in basket A and B and, and C. You know, we want everybody to be as ambitious as they can be, put as many of the concrete uh, provisions in basket A uh, as they can. For those in basket B, we want it to have a short uh, implementation time frame, not years and years down the road. Again, the benefits of this, uh, if we can accelerate the implementation, we accelerate uh, the economic benefits. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, you, you talked about kind of the Hill and, and, and U.S. policy and, and, and development policy and the fact that, you know, the U.S. development budget is, 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 is not growing. Uh, you know, we think one of the most important messages is that this is such a win-win for the United States uh, because it certainly supports our development goals because th every study has shown that investments in trade facilitation can have a disproportionate impact in terms of improving a country's uh, ability to compete in the global economy, accelerate its development uh, trajectory. Uh, and so it's, it's a win-win for uh, th those countries. The investments we're talking about are very modest, in fact, uh, especially if you compare them to uh, building roads and bridges. You know, mostly we're talking about buying some computers and doing some training. These kinds of things are very modest, but they can, they can return a huge economic impact. So again, very cost effective. And then secondly, it's a win for the United States because it helps U.S. exports. Making foreign customs uh, procedures more transparent, more simple, more accessible will help U.S. companies trying to sell into those markets, especially small and medium-sized companies who are our primary customers. A lot of what we do is try to navigate all of those uh, customs arrangements around the world. But if they can start to do it themselves, if they're not intimidated by it, if it makes more sense to them, they will start to export more. Uh, and that, again, is, is strongly, su strongly supports uh, some key U.S. Uh, economic objectives. So when you look at all the different things to spend money on, we think this is a win-win uh, and really will provide a, a, great, a great return for the United States. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Ralph. Anna, you've worn various hats uh, on this around this conversation. You've been in the private sector. You've been at the, Com the Commerce Department. You've been with U.S. Treasury as part of the delegation representing the United States in front of the World Bank Group. Um, <clears throat> talk about trade facilitation from those perspectives. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. And um, I think, you know, one of the key things to really think about is where do we go from here? So we have this great agreement, thank you, Don. And um, I know that uh, some of us have been pushing for this since the early 90s. And now we've got something in writing and there, there is a, a party going on and that's very good and it's very well deserved because it's, it's been a long time coming. But the reality is, let's, let's look at this. Um, actually in December when this was being completed, it was also the 10 year anniversary of the US-Chile Free Trade Agreement. And the U.S.-Chile Free Trade Agreement was the first trade agreement that actually had trade facilitation provisions in it, including, you know, some of the very, uh, it, this, uh, the WTO agreement has expanded on that, but it did have some of the very basic agreements on it, and specifically on express delivery at that time as well. And following Chile, then, you know, then it was Singapore, we expanded on that, all of the CAFTA, Colombia, Panama. But where are we on those? We've got these great free trade agreements that have outlined these trade facilitation provisions, and they're not fully implemented, especially if we look at countries like Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, in the CAFTA countries. Um, so 
this is where we come in and we're looking at this. We've got a great agreement. And what's really good about this is this ABC thing and, and, uh, and a commitment to help the developing countries and the least developed countries to actually implement that. Because without that, then we've just got another agreement with really nice words on it. And maybe not any much better than what's already been done by the WCO, which were great uh, thing, uh, guidelines, but uh, weren't um, uh, uh, mandatory or commitment or binding. So looking at, um, to Dan's question, what he wanted me to do was really focus on, in my experience, um, working on these issues with governments, within government, and in the development community. One of the things that, you know, we've really noticed, and I, Ralph touched on this as well, is going to each country individually and seeming to be starting from scratch. And what can be read as a, as a, as a guideline or a commitment or a provision for expedited uh, clearance or for coordination between customs agencies or that means different things to different people. So I think one of the really key things that can happen interagency within our own process here and also within uh, the international financial institutions and other international organizations like the World Economic Forum, the International Trade Center, and all these organizations that are working on this, is to try to push forward a s sort of, what can I call it, open source best practices. Let me take an example. Um, one of the provisions is for risk assessment for customs clearance. And the idea is that if you have a risk assessment procedure, you can identify what packages and what shipments to look at through scientific numbers and through computers. And then that way, you're focusing on the ones that are either going to bring you the most revenue or are going to um, be most likely to maybe have some issues that you can stop for security or for tariff reasons or for whatever the reason may be. So as, a, as an industry, and I know because we, we bought this battle with uh, FedEx for many years when I was at UPS, we go to each country and we would offer help and each country would have to start from the beginning of where do we start? We need some software. Well, the, the private sector would offer s their software, and they'd be circumspect of that. Well, we can't take the FedEx software. We can't take the UPS software because that's going to, you know, maybe there's something in the software that's going to favor them or something like that. So, um, so then they would start from scratch to build this software. What I call is that we have like the World Bank or these international organizations get together and put together an open source software for risk uh, assessment implementation for other things so that each of these countries and if we're making our monies really go as far as it can go and we don't have this patchwork like uh, uh, Ralph was alluding to is let's have something that is created that can be taken by all of these uh, countries and use that so that we have more harmonization and we have simplification and we're not having to have to go each time and reinvent the wheel. So what does that mean as far as all these organizations? The WCO just met uh, a few a few days ago on January 20th with the WTO to talk about what they can do. So the WCO is going to publish uh, implementation tools that's going to connect what the WTO negotiated with the WCO rules. And they're planning on putting on some briefing documents to customs officials in their countries on how they can um, connect with their trade ministers. Because what, what does this mean? One thing that we've noticed is that customs officials are very technical. And they have their way of doing their own thing. And this is where the trade ministers and the people that have negotiated these things really need to have a nexus interagency on how this is going um, to work and how they can 
uh, cooperate to uh, implement these things. And this is where, like, the private sector, Ralph and uh, people like the ITC can come in and get their views in place. Because no matter how well intentioned um, a policy official may be, if they don't have the actual practice in in the actual real functioning world, their policy and their theory might not actually work. And we've seen this in the past so many times in the private sector where well-meaning policymakers would write regulations and laws, but they just didn't make sense in the real world. So another one of my calls for action besides having you know these open source uh, kind of initiatives is Emphasis in looking at the um, providing legal assistance on the rulemaking. Because once the regulations and the rules are made, and if they're passed through the national organizations, then, then, it's, a, then it's a little bit harder to go back and change those. And a lot of these countries, maybe they don't have all the necessary internal knowledge on what is actually going to make an efficient law or regulation. And, um, and so I think that that is one of the areas that interagency-wise and also between multilateral IFIs and um, or organizations to get out the help, and I think we have some Department of Commerce folks here, and I think that uh, the Department of Commerce has in their general counsel's office actually a service that provides um, regulatory and legal help to different countries on capacity building. We need to get those kinds of agencies involved so that we can help these countries write the laws and the regulations um, that they need to do it. I think another uh, interesting way to bring in all the different parties, and Ralph, you mentioned you were just at the APEC meeting in Bali right before the WTO. APEC model for customs facilitation, I think, is really a best practice. What does the model do? It brings together uh, the private sector, it brings a peer review, and it brings uh, a, a system to give uh, uh, best practices, and then it, it helps the country. So I'll give you an example. In the APEC model, let's say uh, it's going to uh, a country that wants to upgrade its customs um, and trade facilitation provisions. In the APEC customs facilitation group, they'll bring countries that have done this well, like for example, Singapore, Taiwan, um, these other countries. They'll bring in the private sector that have best practices, like a FedEx, and they'll come together and they do a peer review of what that country is doing. And they come up with a checklist of things that need to be done and what kind of assistance and help uh, they need. Then they come back a year later to see where they are on that. And the key to this APEC system is that it brings everybody together. And there isn't this misconception of, I can't have this other country looking at me, or I'm going to uh, somehow be thought of less if I have another country coming and looking at my procedures. So I would call, as we're setting up all these monies and all these procedures and uh, the WTO and the World Bank and the IDB that we get together and, uh, and really look at to put together something that has peer review and private sector and a process that brings all the parties together, not just initially, but throughout the whole um, process. I think you know, the, the World Bank, and Dan had asked me to talk a little bit about this, and the IDB and a lot of these organizations, since Aid for Trade uh, a few years ago, five years ago or so, really uh, got up and going through the WTO, um, have put in a lot of programs to fund Aid for Trade and has given a lot of help to these different countries uh, on Aid for Trade. And, um, and a lot of that up until now has been uh, focused on looking at what are the costs of, uh, of goods being stuck at the borders. And this have all been very good research 
that has been done. And there's been a lot of uh, looking at to see what, what slows down a, um, the movement of goods. And what does that mean when the movements of goods are slowed down? And what does it mean in the least developed countries when uh, it's 43% more uh, cost of trade uh, trying to get your goods through a customs clearance in a less developed country than a, than a developed country. And those have all been really great studies. And I think, you know, the lesson on there is that trade facilitation aspect is very important. And it is. But other things have also been identified, which have to be with infrastructure, with uh, many other things that affect this. So the whole movement of goods and getting them through these points um, is, is really broader than trade facilitation. But it's like they say, how, how, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat them one bite at a time, and that's really what we're looking at. And this trade facilitation agreement is that one bite. There may be many other things that are related to getting goods across the border, but we need um, uh, to do that. And, um, and I, I think that, you know, interagency, one of the most important lessons that we can learn is how, how do they talk to each other? How can we work together to really um, uh, come together with the private sector and to help organizations like, let's say, it's USAID, or uh, Paul's going to be talking about um, uh, the Hill. How do we get those messages and help those organizations like USAID get the help that they need to be able to support these initiatives. I'm at 13 minutes, but I, so I'm going to stop there and uh, turn it over to Paul. Yep. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, um, CSIS, again for the invitation. It's it's a real pleasure to be sitting at this table with some former mentors and friends and colleagues and. Uh, not surprisingly, they've covered uh, many of the, the points that, that uh, I think are, are most important. So I will try and, and just hit a couple highlights and, and maybe, I think as Dan mentioned, I, I come at this at, with sort of a variety of perspectives. And I've, I've worked at USTR for a number of years uh, in the Bush administration. I worked at FedEx for three years working on these trade facilitation issues from the commercial perspective and also worked on the Finance Committee uh, as Trade Council and sort of saw how the the legislative uh, trade committees uh, look at trade facilitation and trade policy more broadly. Um, I do think that the topic of this is about trade facilitation and development. And as you've heard today, and, and I'm sure you know, read and, and gone to studies and or gone to other speakers and seen studies that we really have in the last few years seen a, a remarkable amount of attention paid to global value chains, global supply chains, trade facilitation, trade costs. I mean, this, this really is, is a relatively new phenomenon in terms of being front and center uh, in the trade policy debate and sort of international globalization debate. Um, and why is that? Well, as, as Ralph hit on some of the statistics that he went through, that's where the costs are now. You know, that we, we have the opportunity with technology, with multimodal transportation and delivery services, that literally consumers and, and sellers can reach each other instantaneously through e-commerce and can actually get their products in days, if not hours, from when they make their orders. And yet, in certain regions of the world or certain countries, we're still talking about weeks and months just across a border with their neighbor. So that stark kind of divergence, you know, is, is a core development issue. So I won't get into the details of, of the trade facilitation agreement and, and sort of its structure, but I do think that what they accomplished in Bali, what Don and her colleagues and, and all the various folks who've worked so hard on this have done, is by creating a multilateral agreement focusing on enforceable uh, commitments on trade facilitation that are concrete. And, and admittedly, you know, as Ralph, I think, pointed out, what the content of how you implement those commitments will be will be critically important. But by setting that in place, this agreement actually is, is sort of the perfect place to, to look at the nexus between trade and development, because these are where the costs are, and these are, are the policies that are really holding back uh, a lot of countries from participating in the global economy. Um, so I think I just wanted to step back, because I think that's why this is so topical, and that why how this agreement is implemented really is going to have a dramatic impact 
on, on our development policy, but also on the commercial goals, uh, as Ralph mentioned, of, of U.S. exporters and U.S. small businesses, but also the, the commercial sectors and all the other WTO members. Um, while serving on the Hill, I think it's, it's, it's actually quite illustrative that, you know, trade policy is done in, in the Finance Committee where I served and also the Ways and Means Committee, but development policy is really done in Foreign Relations and the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Appropriations Committees. Um, and it's interesting because trade and development has been a topic for quite some time. And, you know, growing trade and increasing trade should increase development, at least many think so. Um, but our committee structures are set up where the jurisdictions are, are bifurcated or balkanized in a way that, that maybe we haven't been able to pull them together completely. So on the trade side, you know, my old committee, we would deal with trade agreement negotiations, such as the trade facilitation agreement, trade preference programs in terms of tariff relief, um, customs issues in terms of U.S. customs and, and, and uh, U.S. customs interactions with other countries. But on the foreign affairs, foreign relations, they would deal with the USAID budgets, they would deal with the trade capacity building or the appropriate committees. Um, we really d didn't interact uh, as much as one might hope. Um, this agreement is going to require oversight from the Hill on both sides. So uh, I'm hopeful. I think there's a real opportunity here to help the, the trade policy expertise and commercial expertise of the trade committees to get better involved and integrated into the oversight by the foreign relations and the appropriations committees and vice versa. So I, I think that we, we all as stakeholders in this private sector, uh, public sector, NGOs, multilateral, are, should be invested in using this opportunity to help break down some of those jurisdictional barriers because this agreement actually can demonstrate how trade and development policy can work together. Um, just a couple comments on the agreement itself. I think f most folks covered it already, but the way I see it is that how you sequence, prioritize, and harmonize the commitments, particularly by the developing countries, is really going to determine the effectiveness of this agreement, certainly in the near term. Um, as has been mentioned, there's a lot of stakeholders now who will play a role in that. Um, how the donors resource which priorities is critically important, you know, and, and how, how do they determine what is it, what efforts are the World Bank going to do with a particular country vis-a-vis -vis what the corporate sector or foundation might also do vis-a-vis -vis what USAID is going to do, and how do you coordinate that? Um, I think the APEC example is a very good one, but, but coming up with models to ensure that the various actors that are going to be involved in implementing this agreement are talking to each other, and that the private sector, because as Ralph said, and certainly from my experience working at FedEx as well, you know, these are very technical uh, commitments to implement, and there are different ways to do it. And if everyone does it a different way, it will not work. Um, and so the only people who can provide that expertise are the actual operational commercial actors in these countries who are trying to get goods in and out of those countries and can say, look, actually, here's the first problem you need to focus on, or here's the, and what's happening in this country is actually very different than its neighbor. So how do we create that feedback loop? How do we ensure that we have best practices, we have harmonization, but we also do have sort of a country-specific assessment, which USAID is doing, but making sure the private sector and the donors outside of the U.S. government are also contributing to that. I think all of these of sequencing, prioritization, harmonization, that really is going to be the, the key. So uh, I think finally I'll just say that, you know, this agreement will not implement itself. Um, so the folks, the, the, the exceptional work the negotiators did in getting the first agreement in the WTO and ever and also taking you know, over the 20 years, we all have a vested interest in that succeeding. So it's going to take all the various actors kind of coming together, you know, working with the individual WTO members, helping the U.S. negotiators and, and the aid and donor community to, to ensure that that success takes place. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that because I think we've got a great group here and, and Q&A will be interesting. Go from there. You know, I'm going to, I'm just thinking about the time, and I know there are a lot of thoughtful people in the audience. I think I'm going to suggest we go directly to the audience, and I'm going to do this World Bank style, and I'm going to collect three or four questions or comments, and I'll take folks, but as part of the deal, if you, if I take, if I call on you, as you're going to keep your question short and your comment short and pithy, and that way you get points for that, because if not, I'll put you on the, the list of not to call on, do not call list in the future. So. Um, I'd ask you to identify yourself, the organization, and then, as I said, a short comment or a short question so that we can bunch together about four of these, and then we'll have the panelists respond, and maybe we'll get a couple more, and I'd like to try and get about six. So raise your hands. Hi, I see Ambassador Michael here. He's going to get the first one. This gentleman here, I want a little bit of gender diversity, so I'd like, yes, this woman in the front row, and then I'll take a fourth as well. Who's the, who's the lucky number four? 
the person in the back. Okay, so the gentleman in the very back. Okay, so start with Ambassador Michael, then this gentleman, then this woman in the front row, and then the gentleman in the back row. Ambassador Michael, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is bringing back a lot of memories of when I used to do this. And uh, the problem, I think, in part is that development is going to be different depending on the politics within each of the countries. And I think it's wonderful to think in terms of harmonization and uh, common approaches. But I think these have to be then worked in the context of the policy environment and the capacities and commitments that you find in the different countries. And that means it's going to be sequenced and prioritized probably in different ways. If you have uh, a finance minister who's counting on customs revenues for a big part of the national budget and a trade minister who's trying to facilitate things that will cut into that, you know, you're going to have to figure out how does that, how do you work that in the country context? And so I think part of you have, what you have to think about is the incentives. And one of the things that I remember from the past was that doing trade promotion that raises the stakes and the potential so that you're not just helping them to comply with agreements that others have suggested they should comply with, but also helping them to get access to markets and create some wealth <laughs> and jobs in their country uh, helps a lot. And I just wonder how you've thought about bringing those somewhat different disciplines of development and trade together in a way that will really work and carry out these objectives uh, that you've all uh, talked about for implementation. And, and Ambassador Michael, in addition to being the former ambassador of Guatemala and having a, a distinguished career at aid, was also the head of the Major League Baseball Commission of Foreign Aid. It's not called that. It's called the <laughs> DAC. It's the Development Assistance Committee. So he was in, so had a coordinating function at the OECD looking at all the different wealthy country donor agencies. And so I think one of the other questions, I think, that's not been fully covered in this conversation so far is, okay, where are the Europeans or the Canadians and how are they going to spend their money to make this trade facilitation stuff happen? So thank you, Ambassador Michael. This gentleman. Uh, Sherman Katz, I'm a trade lawyer and I'm not an expert on development, but I wonder if I can put a question to Eric Postel of USAID, although he's not on the panel. I just wonder if you've considered the possibility of and again, I'm humble on the subject of USAID and its programs, but have you considered the possibility that these tasks, a number of which uh, uh, might be done by USAID, uh, should be assembled into, and I'm going to use those words which are perhaps bad words in Washington, a new program. And uh, I saw briefly in Vietnam how the STAR program was so enormously helpful at getting Vietnam to adopt new laws which con and, and regulations which contributed enormously to improvement of the business environment there. Thank you. This woman up front here. Okay. Laura Dagner from the Embassy of Costa Rica. Thank you for a very interesting panel. Um, I think free trade agreements already existing are a great platform basically to work on trade facilitation issues and really that should be in the agenda of any free trade committee meeting. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of CAFTA, uh, there has been only two meetings of the Free Trade Committee. On the second one, which was about three years ago, the ministers launched an initiative on trade facilitation, basically recognizing that that was needed to broaden the benefits of the agreement. But uh, I don't want to point anyone, but we really didn't <laughs> feel much support from the USTR to move forward on this agenda, and we understand all the constraints you know, on everything you're negotiating. So the Central American countries decided we're gonna do this, you know, on our own. There were seven priorities identified by the region as the top uh, trade facilitation priorities with the help, you know, of, of the private sector, the, even the U.S. Chamber here was very involved. And we're working on that with different donors. But aside of what we're doing, you know, I want to emphasize that free trade agreements already existing should you know be a platform and hopefully the u.s will use that platform also there is another program called 
uh, Pathways to Prosperity that is run by the Department of, uh, by the State Department, where many Latin American countries are participating. Costa Rica uh, co-chairs the pillar on trade facilitation, but we've been a bit frustrated to know that the funding for Pathways basically has a very strong uh, emphasis on linkages with environmental and labor issues, which are very important, but trade facilitation should be a key priority by itself without linkages. Thank you very much. I just want to make a couple comments. Thank you for flagging the fact that there, I think, some of Paul's comments about the disconnect between agreements and then the funding for those agreements that are in different jurisdictions and then sort of the competing priorities for limited foreign assistance dollars that may not have been talking to the to the tr to the so the first thing I want to thank you for flagging that I also want you to I want to thank you for flagging what I think Anna mentioned earlier about the fact that these implementation takes time I guess is maybe one way to put it and I appreciate you reminding us that perhaps um, it's taking some time to fully implement some agreements that may have been agreed upon 10 years ago and so perhaps there may be a need for some further alacrity here in in Washington on that and then the third I would just want to recognize that Costa Rica is if you haven't been to Costa Rica re recently, it's just an inspiring country. It's one of the reasons I got into the development business, and it's on its on verge of becoming a member of the OECD, one of the wealthy, I know they don't like calling it this, but it's like the wealthy country club, and they are a great country. They're a democracy, and uh, they are also a middle-income country and, uh, and really a country to emulate, and, and both in the region and, and around the world. So thank you for being here. Thank you. The gentleman back there had the last question or comment. Sir. Sir, the floor is yours. Whoever had their hand up, oh. the lot you, you said the back row. That threw me. That's you. Okay, um, just to follow up, actually, three of the comments: Steve Landing, Manchester Trade. Uh, one of the challenges that we're going to face, particularly in Africa, maybe in Central America, is that most of their progress has been made on a regional basis. The WTO, however, focuses on countries and countries' responsibilities, etc. We saw what happened when the European Union decided to negotiate free trade agreements, which may be very good, but with individual countries, which destroyed efforts at a common external tariff. So let me just ask two fairly specific questions. One, is it possible for the regional communities who are not really recognized yet in the WTO, but they have not fulfilled the requirements for a recognition to somehow participate in this exercise, or for that matter, for, to allow you guys to build on all the work they already have done on trade facilitation. And then the second question is more for USAID, and notice a couple of very important people here from USAID, and that is that for a developing country, they're interested both in assistance to facilitate imports, but they're also interested in assistance to facilitate exports out of the country. And whether it's possible, particularly if we take Sherman's idea of a new program, to maybe focus on both of those together. And honestly, I believe the benefits then to developing countries and the fact that we'll have to take dispute settlement obligations, which is very hard for developing countries, as you know, and so on, may be softened and may be in our own interest. So two simple questions are, one, how do regional economic communities participate in this exercise, which is really on a national basis? And two, how can we combine, at least in our aid facilitation efforts, both the idea of facilitating imports, but also facilitating exports from the countries? Thank you so much. I'm going to have Eric, and I'm also going to put my friend Virginia on the spot. I'm sure she'll thank me for this later. She's thrilled, I'm sure. But I'd like each of you to just respond to the AID specific questions. Eric, I'm going to give you mainly the floor, but I'd also like to hear just briefly from Virginia, given that she does a lot of this, this stuff for a day job. So, hi, Jim. Um, I love STAR. I went to Vietnam, um, and I agree, and I know USTR, all of us in the government have seen how that has really affects um, trade. So, um, but by the same token, some of the panelists we're talking about, I think, gave me food for thought about interesting things that, you know, how do you, how do, you do this in a way that isn't sort of dictatorial, but on the other hand, where you come together around some open source things, so it's not all one-offs. And I think we have to think through some ways where maybe we encourage people without requiring people to, to coalesce. And that actually affects, I think, the, the comment, you, you were talking about exports, sir, but also the regional trade. You know, I, 
I believe, I'm not the trade expert that some of these people are, but I believe the theory is that if everybody signs up to a lot of these things, then all forms of trade are going to start moving faster. So it's not just about imports from developed countries into developing countries. It's about getting their exports out faster. It's about the trade amongst the countries. Because, heck, you know, there are some African countries where moving the stuff right across their borders within the same continent among the neighbors is worse than it is from them up to Europe or over to here or whatever. So I, I think that um, uh, we've got to do a lot of thinking. My head's buzzing from some of the comments and things. Uh, and, and Virginia and our team and our whole inter, uh, our, all the bureaus within USAID have to start thinking about this and, and what would be a good way to support it, but in coordination and combination with private sector, with European donors and, and other people. And, and maybe even some non-traditional people. I mean, the Brazilians, the Chinese, other people, they're starting to be donors. This stuff benefits them too. So what, what can we do? I don't have the answers yet, but I think it's things that we have to think through. OK, Virginia, please, if you just respond. You've heard this interesting conversation. There have been some questions directed to AID. Would you want to just double click on either anything Eric said or anything comment just briefly? Katie, this, this, this woman back here, or anything you've just heard on the panel, you get 30 seconds of air time. Thanks, Dan. Everybody who knows Dan knows that he likes to put people on the spot, like, instantaneously. I'm Virginia Brown. I work for Eric. I'm the head of the Trade and Regulatory Reform uh, Office at USAID. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly, since I only have 30 seconds, respond to Steve, though. I mean, I think the issue about the RECs is really, really important. And Don can touch a little bit on this. Um, through the negotiations, the Africans especially, but others in regional groupings, were very concerned about this. And there are some provisions that that, that, that touch on this a little bit, but there, um, I think we've always viewed WTO agreements in, in some ways as, as the floor. Like, Rex can then go above that, but this would at least help some of them to get a unified standard among themselves. And then if they choose as a rec to go above that, which is the ideal, we hope, we hope that they will do that. So I think it's just, I think it's an encouragement for the RECs, uh, for the regional economic communities to uh, talk about this as a group. I know Don will probably touch on this too as she responds, but we want them as developing countries to get together as regional entities and decide A, B, and C among themselves. This is the perfect opportunity. I mean, I, I, people know I get really passionate about this. This is the perfect opportunity to, for them to have that dialogue and to, and to move as a regional grouping to say, we're going to do this together and we're going to pick the same time frames and we're going to put the same things in A, B, and C, even if some of us are a little behind that. It, it provides incentive within those regional groupings. And I love the fact that my boss, Eric, said the exact right thing on import and export. He's, he's got it. That's the message. It helps both import and export. Thank you. We're going to go this way. I'm going to have each of you respond. You can respond, but there's a whole series of things I want you to respond to. I'm going to start with Paul, then we're going to Anna, then Ralph, and then Don will have the last word. So, Paul, you're up. Just a, a couple observations. One, I think on the donor issue and this open source idea, I think th that's really where you know, that was the concern of the developing countries is they didn't have the capacity or the resources to do this. This is the opportunity for the donors to coordinate amongst themselves to, to figure out, okay, what, what commitments these different countries, whether regionally or, or individually, would help advance their development goals the quickest? And how can we work together in, in what the World Bank is doing, what USAID is doing, what the private sector is willing to step in and do. So the open source concept is really interesting, and I'm, I'm glad you, you seized on that as well, because what you don't want is a bunch of kind of silo donor activities going on that have nothing to do with each other, and then developing countries just trying to find somebody who will pay them to do what they're willing to do, but it's not part of any kind of strategy or, or coordinated approach. Um, the other, as far as the import and the export, I think, you know, when I think about these issues, I, I always focus on how quickly the global supply chain sort of infrastructure has changed and how transformative that has been and how global value chains have disaggregated manufacturing to such an extent that improving your import process will improve your export process. I mean, it, 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 it just goes hand in glove and that the real goal is to help more countries fully participate in those global su uh, supply and value chains. So, that may be an overarching concept that can help inform 
how do they sequence, prioritize, work together as regions. But, but that's, that's what's going on in the developed economies, the emerging economies. So that should be the target that informs how you set your prioritization going forward. Paul, I think that's a great point. Um, it, you know, as mentioned uh, by some of the speakers that the least developed countries or the developing countries had concerns about signing on to this thing. And part of those concerns were that this was going to help the developed countries more than it was going to help them because it would help more imports come into their own countries. But then, you know, they'd have more foreign imports. And then what? So I think this import-export thing is very important because, um, it, it, as Paul just mentioned, it's going to help uh, set up some of the sequencing because if countries can show that it's easier to import and facilitate the exporting, it's going to attract more investment into their countries for the uh, and allow them to participate in these greater value chains that are growing and, and, and growing. So uh, and that again is why it's so important to have early participation of the private sector and of organizations that have coordinated private sector thoughts and, uh, and bring these things together so that as the B and C commitments are, are made, that uh, they're done in a way that uh, brings in what is really most needed um, in, in this area. Of, uh, of making sure that the value chain proposition for these uh, developing countries is able to be maximized in the best way pro uh, process. And I also just wanted to comment on what our friend from the Costa Rican Embassy had talked about. And, and it's just such a great example, Central America, because you've got these uh, great countries in and of themselves and how much greater all of Central America could be if the trade even with amongst themselves, we're not even talking about U.S., just Costa Rica or U.S., Guatemala, but the countries amongst themselves could trade more freely. And I know when I was uh, working for a, a, a big retailer, one of the issues that we had was that we had stores in each of the countries in Central America, but we really couldn't have economies of scale going um, uh, sending goods between those stores, everything had to come back to the U.S. and then to those stores. So it really, you know, it created, you know, this mess. And even for uh, being able to send things to uh, Central America or bring them from Central America to take to other parts of the world, it was a headache because each country had very different uh, rules. So this also goes back to regionalization. And somebody out there made the uh, suggestion of if you get together and approach your commitments for the A, B, and Cs in a regional manner, that that could facilitate things. But, you know, as I mentioned, that's what makes this agreement different from the FTAs that we had bilaterally, is that this agreement has had donors commit to have specific money. And so then it's, you know, being able to use that as effectively as we can. Okay, Ralph. Uh, just, just following up on the export question, uh, uh, there's actually, uh, Catherine Mann, I think, has done a series of studies uh, uh, working with the Peterson Institute. And I read these years ago, and I was fascinated because what it showed was when a country does autonomous customs modernization improvements on its own, the bigger impact that it's that it uh, experienced was an increase in exports. The export increased greater than imports. Seems counterintuitive, but the reason is, if you look at the f figures today that the WTO has now demonstrated, 60 percent of global trade is in component parts. These are things moving around as part of a global supply chain that are going into a country to be assembled, connected to whatever, into something else. And then 40% of the, of the value of, every, of the average export is imported content. So nobody's making things as an island anymore. The production chains are global. And so if you want to be an efficient exporter, you've got to be an efficient importer. Uh, and, and the economic and, and, and academic data 
bear that out. Uh, so it's it's a win-win. It helps you export. It also helps your trading partners uh, access your markets, and that makes you a more productive uh, and efficient manufacturer. Hey, Don, you get the last word. Well, to touch on a, a couple of the, uh, the issues I heard from the audience, and thank you for the great questions. You know, on the, the aid side, you know, just to complement what Eric and Virginia had said, uh, we approached these negotiations from the standpoint that we have uh, a very robust aid structure in place, and we have aid effectiveness principles in place, and we were not going to recreate the wheel for this agreement, given that we have this structure there and it has been effective and we have received positive feedback from the developing countries on this. Um, so the mantra throughout the negotiation was always, this is going to continue to be a bottom-up, demand-driven process, that these countries have to have the buy-in. Rule number one in negotiations is always, you can't want it more than they do. Mm -hmm. So these countries had to want this agreement. And, you know, when we would discuss Section 2, we would always go into the negotiations with, do you want what is in Section 1? And if you want what is in Section 1, Section 2 is here to help you get it. If you don't want what is in Section 1, you need to step up and negotiate what you do want in Section 1. And they're all there at the table, and they all can do it, and they did. I mean, we heard, I mean, there were countries... Um, like Comoros, uh, the uh, Rwanda, um, Laos, Cambodia, I mean, small countries coming to the table, stepping up, saying their piece on what they wanted, what their national priorities were in this agreement. Uh, I mean, it was great to see that type of participation from these countries, that they want to be part of these global supply chains. So the, the buy-in, I think, is there. And, I, you know, the resources are there. The challenge is coordinating those resources and coordinating the donors. And, of course, the OECD has played a very key role in that. And the, the WTO uh, has held throughout the negotiations, and Virginia has been key at participating in these donor coordination meetings. Um, the, the international financial institutions, you know, the World Bank, the various development banks, the IMF, have all come out with these op-ed pieces saying they can pay for this. I, the money is there. But it's ensuring that all of the donors and uh, the various entities that have this assistance, and I think the private sector has a lot to contribute in terms of these best practices, um, and we need to figure out how to tap them into all of this work that is going on um, to ensure that they are a component part of this. Um, the and, and just, you know, on the Pathways to Prosperity, it's, it's a great example of how much work is going on, and there are these great programs out there that do tie into the um, – the, the assistance that's available. And I would say that the, the CAFTA countries, uh, a number of the South American countries, were some of the strongest supporters of this agreement, recognizing the, the potential for the regional integration uh, to come from it. And on the regional issue and moving forward on a regional basis, this does come back to the point uh, that uh, was raised, I, I think, by Virginia. You know, they, 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 there's nothing stopping these countries, the, you know, the East African Community Secretariat, from saying, I want want to be an observer in the Trade Facilitation uh, Preparatory Committee. But they have to get their act together and do it. The rest of the WTO membership can't do it for them. I and mean, we can encourage them in that manner, but, but ultimately they have to do their own coordination efforts and they have to um, come to the table to press for, for that. And on the, the issue, and I, I really wanted to comment on this, that dispute settlement is very hard, no. Really, it's not. I, 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 would, I would disagree with that statement. Um, we have never, there's never been a case against the least developed country. There's never been a case brought against a country that wanted to implement a WTO provision and was taking steps to do it. And we've been through the negotiations. We know that the countries want to implement these. If they are taking steps towards implementation and their honest efforts towards implementation, there are the resources and there are the mechanisms through the WTO process to help them reach those goals. Um, so look forward to working with a number of you in the future on ensuring we reach that implementation point. So, Thank you. So $500 billion, uh, if we get this right, there's $500 billion. That's four times all the foreign aid that's spent around the world every year. So the stakes are big. 
Uh, but it's going to require both getting uh, the U.S. government's act together in terms of coordinating resources, some of which we're going to have to find. It's not as if the aid administrator's got a safe in his office and is going to go find this money to pay for this stuff. And it's also going to mean how we have sophisticated conversations with um, local governments, local partners on the ground, IFIs, as well as, of course, the private sector. So this is not a – the implementation – it, so th this has been hard getting to here. Getting the $500 billion prize for developing countries is going to require uh, a long marathon as well. So thank you all very much.